Every year, a new concept is created. It might be a new spin on a genre, a new system, or a new entry in a legacy franchise. And more often than not, it makes a new generation forget those older concepts, the beginnings of genres, those older systems, or where those legacy franchises even began. So often we forget about the roots of video game history. To me, it's a dying art, knowledge that is slowly disappearing from time. I still remember being eight years old and playing Torin's Passage, getting lost in the layers of the lands below, but I still explored. I recall racking my brain because the lost mind of Dr. Brain's puzzles were just too much for me, but I strove to solve them anyway. I remember feeling a sense of justice by protecting the public with Police Quest, and while I never would become a police officer in my own personal life, that role in the art form of video gaming was something that I took seriously, and I didn't need to. Sierra was a big part of my childhood, and I figured the best way to explore gaming history from a truly organic perspective was to reach out to the folks who made that era of gaming happen. On a whim, I decided to send Mr. Ken Williams an email and I requested an interview. And to my surprise, he agreed to it. And that's the purpose of today's episode, to sit down and have a candid discussion with the creator of some of our favorite childhood memories. This is part one of two of my interview with the creator of Sierra, Mr. Ken Williams. Hello everybody, my name is Fortifier, and today I have the luxury of sitting down with one of the most influential people in video game history. As we know, he's the creator of our favorite childhood memories. You might know him as Chief Kini Wawa or Kenny the Kid and Freddy Farkas, but I know him as the pariah of point-and-click genre and the creator of online systems, which would eventually become Sierra. And currently, the big bad boss man at Cygnus Entertainment, Mr. Ken Williams, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, how about you? I, I'm doing great. It's it feels like just you know just yesterday we were having this conversation. <laughs> For yeah. anybody who doesn't know, we, I messed up, forgot to hit record, but we only went about ten minutes into this. So uh, see, I just wanted to start off by saying congrats on a proper release of Colossal Cave. I know that that was a very exciting release, not only for yourself, especially since it's been quite a long time since we've seen you do anything in the industry, especially after you know Sierra went through all of its acquisitions. And uh, I know it was very exciting for folks in the late 70s who experienced it for the first time, um, playing Don Woods' adventure, William Crowther, depending on who, you know, which version you played. I was actually gonna ask you about that, which version, um, oh. Yeah, I, I, I should comment on that. The um, One of the coolest things about this project was that we got to um, um, interact with uh, Don Woods and William, William Crowther. The uh, Don Woods did a lot of the QA, and um, I don't know why, I guess because it was 50 years ago, I expected him to be, um, you know, kind of doddering old man, I mean, to be polite. Um, or impolite, I guess. And uh, no, I mean, his uh, emails back to us when he was QAing the game showed that, um, showed his personality. It was like Roberta's uh, emails with tons of, uh, tons of good information and history. And sooner or later, I'll publish those. And then uh, recently, um, William Crowther sent a picture of uh, him playing our game in VR. No yeah, way. It's such a uh, historical thing to imagine him uh, at the birth of the uh, computer industry, uh, writing one of the very first ever text games. And then uh, now he's playing it in VR. So it's this nice symmetry, I guess, or whatever for the game. So if there ever but, was a moment in your life where you had like a little bit of a fanboy moment, it'd be that exact moment. You probably never would have thought that yeah. you're sitting in front of a teletype and here, you know, 50 years later, you've got a, you got an old man strapped to the, <laughs> strapped to the there face of VR it's, reliving. Uh, yep. Yeah, definitely a fanboy moment. So. That's incredible. Uh, the, so icebreaker, um, yeah. Rube Goldberg devices. What's your take on them? Um, well, I mean, obviously I love them. We released a game called the incredible machine and, uh, was done by our dynamics division and it just blew me away. I, um, yeah, I, I don't have much of an attention span, so I need a game where I can just get in and be effective immediately and play and have fun. And that was the, yeah, I mean, the Incredible Machine was the first of its type that I could remember where you could just go in and, I don't know, build things kind of randomly and do fun stuff and not, and, and you know, on-screen physics, uh, some stuff that hadn't been done too much. And yeah, just fun game. 
that and their pinball game. Those were the two that really kind of consumed I've, me. I've played there. I don't remember the name of the pinball game, but I do. There was a period in time where uh, I think it was on my abandonware or GOG, one of those websites that preserve the older uh Older video games oh, yeah. that are either, you know, shareware, abandonware, vaporware, etc. And I played it and I was like, wow, this is good. And I think the only thing for yeah. me that could have rivaled it was that initial pinball set that came with, was it Windows 95? The oh, yeah. Space space Cadet, 3D Space Cadet. <laughs> I remember, did Bill Budge do a pinball game? I don't know, but like anything Sierra, because our pinball game did good. We released it in a lot of different flavors. I think we did a horror version and... I don't remember why, but we managed to pad it out to five or six products. So. <laughs> That's I need to check those out. I, so for me, at least from my experience in playing Sierra games, it's mostly be it's been isolated to um to the point and click era. However, my mother uh -huh. did grace me with the the lost mind of Doctor Brain somewhere in the mid nineties, and that made me hate life yeah. for about you know a solid year. <laughs> now, when we started Cygnus, that was kind of the first thing that came to mind is I wanted to do um, Doctor Brain style games. To, um, you know, I was trying to think how to position away from competition to try to find a space in the market where we could uh, succeed. And then Roberta had the idea of remaking the old adventure game, and so we went that direction. I think that that is that was a that was a great decision because, like I said, that those air, those specific times in video game history are so overlooked because the sheer capacity of individuals like William Crowther to create a world with words in a time where visuals really weren't weren't a thing, right? I, and I'll cover that when we get to, to that, because I do want to cover early okay. history and how you and Miss Roberta uh, interface with Colossal Cave and how it felt in that moment to play it. But I, I do have two other little quick questions. And this is sure. more of a, a hobby thing for you. You've done a lot of cool things. You've sailed across oceans. Yeah. So is that is that your favorite alternative you know hobby other than you know creating video games, marketing video games effectively, which is yeah. primarily what you did? Is it sailing? I, you know, I am kind of... Uh there's only two things that I really do a lot of, and it's boating and uh, computers. So if I'm awake, I'm probably at my computer. And uh, when uh, when we sold Sierra, we kind of retired for 20 years and just took our boat and went around the world and visited 27 countries on a little boat. And, I, and we kind of got a second 15 minutes of fame. I mean, there's almost any, at one point, I, now it's calmed a little, but we could go into almost any marina in the world and everybody would recognize us. It, um, and it was from, uh, you know, we were, we were the first power boat to kind of a personal power boat to cross uh, the Atlantic. And then we went across the Bering Sea and we've been kind of all over the place. That's so. awesome. That's a dream. That's a dream in of itself. Uh, at some point, I hope uh, once all the kids grow up, I think me and my wife, Amanda, we want to just, we want to do a, a backpacking. Uh -huh. Dude, just get on, just get, get backpacks packed up, go around the world and see the world because you, a lot of people my age, they work themselves to death. And that's the, that's the unfortunate truth. That's the society that we live in. For me, you know, I'm 31 and uh, I luck out in the situation that I'm in that my wife will likely be in the same situation where we're not going to be confined to having to work and we can have our own homestead. We grow our own, everything we have, we grow on our own. I've, I haven't bought groceries in probably about two months ever since we oh. did the whole self-sustaining thing. So I'd love to travel. I'd love to travel. Very uh, good. The final initial question is uh, your your stance at Sierra, your position. I know that you you mentioned in other interviews that you you did suit, do some coding. You did do some coding. Oh. Um, most of the time it was for like Leisure Suit Larry for the software piracy aspect of it. Yeah. But your main role, were you more of like a, a market strategist, more of a product oh. development? Kind of. Yeah, I mean, the company grew and roles changed over time. In the very early days, you know, obviously I did all the programming on the first couple of games. And as the company got bigger, I did less and less programming. But I always stayed pretty technical. I mean, I was CEO and president and, I don't know, kind of head boss. But I really tried to focus in development. And even Sierra, you know, most companies today, most of the big publishers are primarily, um, you know, marketing and administration. Sierra was, at the end, we were a thousand people with 700 in development and only 300 in everything else. And a lot of those 300 were even the manufacturing team. So we were a heavily development oriented machine. And most of my life was spent going from team to team to team, kind of um, working with them to solve 
uh, problem issues, whatever they'd be, or try to spur them on to um, uh, do something cool and new that people hadn't seen before. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I, I stayed kind of a developer up to, and, and when we sold the company, I think part of why I wanted to sell was a company that got so big, it wasn't fun anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I, I considered myself a professional airplane rider because all I did was ride on airplanes, go into our different divisions, and it became kind of a big bureaucratic kind of thing. And um, it sounded more fun to go take a boat and go around the world. So, um, and we would never would have done an, well, and actually, I guess part of the fun of Cygnus was that I got to go back to coding and uh, there's a lot of my code that's in uh, Colossal Cave. And so, yeah, that's fun. I, although now we've done it, I, you know, we're kind of at that funny time we're trying to decide what next. Do we go back to boating or do we do another game? And I have no idea. I, I got an idea for you, but we'll save it for the um, end. We'll save, we'll save it for the end. So early history, we're going into Sierra's early history. Obviously, Sierra's not a thing yet. Uh, online systems isn't even a thing yet. Uh, you and Miss Roberta, you have a teletype. You're going through a software library and you find this game that's just called Advent. It's just oh. called Advent. And it's it starts off with you in a building outside of a, a great... Like, how did how did Miss Roberta approach that when she saw that? Did Was she, like, immediately oh. addicted to the game? Because from what you've said, at least in the past, it's... Uh, she was captivated by it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, she, um, yeah, she, she. Uh, you know, it was uh, funny in that it was my teletype. I was using it for work, and she just took it away. And uh, <laughs> she was addicted to the game and wouldn't quit till she solved it. And there was no. I mean, today, you know, if you type in the game on the internet, you get literally thousands and thousands of places to get hints. Oh, yeah. But in those days, there was nothing. I mean, for weeks, we'd go to dinner, and all she could talk about is, you know, how am I going to kill this dragon? So it... Um, <laughs> she just yeah, picks up the fork. She's like, should ask. I try to throw the axe? Should I, yeah, should I, yeah, should I try to throw should the I axe? chop him? Should I try to throw the axe? I got, I got annihilated by those. <laughs> oh, it was... Um, <laughs> Yeah, different world, a different world. So it, uh, but no, she was addicted. And um, I, I, meanwhile, I was trying to figure out, I, I wanted out of LA. I'd done uh, almost 10 years of work in LA for various companies, spending a lot of time on the freeway, trying to get back and forth to work. And I was doing a lot of moonlighting, just uh, programming for different companies in LA. And, um, I kept trying to start different uh, different little enterprises to um, uh, to get something going so that we could move out of Los Angeles. You know, we wanted to live in the woods and um, raise our kids in a more wholesome environment. And um, and well, and then I started on a Fortran compiler. You know, Microsoft started and they were doing Visual Basic and looked like it was going to go somewhere. And I, I thought BASIC was kind of a clunky language and wanted to do Fortran. So I started working on it. And um, meanwhile, Roberta pitched me on doing a game that was like adventure that she'd played. And um, when I talked to a computer store, and there were only eight computer stores in the nation at the time. I mean, it was really just a beginning industry. And um, the computer store was excited about the game and wanted to buy lots of copies and was bored by Fortran. So Sierra became a game company instead of um, a Microsoft competitor. So. And that, that whole idea was kind of born from sitting there thinking, this is cool, but I can do it better. Mm -hmm. And from that, yeah. I guess that's where our, our high res adventures came out on the, was it the Apple II? I believe it was the Apple II. I haven't messed with yeah, them. Those the are Apple a little II. bit too old for I, me. I started it on the TRS-80 and I'd been working on um, Fortran. On the, that We used to call it the Trash-80. It was a little, uh, really gutless machine with a, a cassette tape. And even my first Apple II only had a cassette tape for uh, loading. And you know, when the floppy drive with a massive 80K of storage came out, I think it was actually 110K, but the operating system ate some. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, so that that's what I developed uh, Mystery House on. So I've, I've seen ago. footage of it because just the, the wireframe, at least from someone my age, that could be really rudimentary. But back then that was, that was some that was high octane graphics. 
Yeah, no, even Wozniak sent me an email saying he had never, well, not sent me an email, sent me a physical letter. In those days, there was no concept of email mm -hmm. uh, saying that uh, blew him away when he first saw the Apple II doing graphics because he didn't think it could be done. So it was, uh, yeah, different world. Yeah. Awesome. And now we're going to move further down. We're going to move into the early 80s. Uh, online systems has been a thing at this point. I remember talking to Mr. Allen. He said that it was actually a very ambitious name at the time to say something was online systems because the internet was very much in its infancy. And uh, we mentioned, we talked about the video game crash because the video I worked on him ta uh, talked about the the video game crash of the second generation. I don't remember if it was 83 or 84, but I was curious from, from your perspective, could you see the writing on the wall that the industry was heading that way for the home video game market? Um, you know, I wasn't really focused on video games at all. We were doing games for Apple II and doing well. And um, meanwhile, the 2600, the Atari, um, well, the Atari game machine came along and it was a big market, but it felt like it was just a different market we weren't in. I pretty much ignored it. And then um, our board kind of started twisting my arm that we should consider uh, releasing some games for video game systems because it was a, uh, you know, it was a billion dollar industry at the time. Our business was probably 20 million or something, the entire industry. And uh, so we were kind of a big fish in a uh, infinitesimally small pond. And uh, they wanted me to um, go compete in the bigger, bigger market. So we released a bunch of uh, games for, uh, there was ColecoVision and I'm trying to remember what all devices, um, some that were kind of a hybrid, the Atari 400, I think it was called, and the uh, uh, Nintendo, and there was all the VIC-20. We did a lot of cartridges for all those. And, um, and we were kind of laid into that market and the market crashed before we could bring out all of our titles. And we had diverted all our resources, so we kind of got caught with a warehouse full of inventory and um, unmarkable product. So it was kind of a crash, almost took the company under and really did take the company under. I mean, we basically restarted. We laid off everybody and um, Roberta actually ran all of the accounting and um, took over and we kind of built it back up again. I think Mr. Al said that from where where he was, and I know I mentioned him because he he really is a very approachable person in the industry. He uh -huh. will talk your head off if you allow him. He's a great guy. But he mentioned uh, that for the most part, the way Sierra survived it, the way they weathered it, was that you would contract out people specifically, contract people out specifically for the project, so that we you didn't have all of that money going, you know, funneling into an infinite expanse of employees. It was, this is who I want on this. We're going to make it through this. We're going to be fine. And I'm glad that you did because after that, it was straight up, straight up for yeah, you. Some people were working for free. I think even Al Lowe was working for free. He, um, you know, he, he got a piece of action on his products, but nothing was selling at that point in time. It was really a disaster time. And, um, yeah, I'm surprised we turned it around. I mean, our, our board of directors said they had never seen a company turn it around like that, that we were, I was borrowing against our house to have enough money to keep the company in business. We had been up to 120 employees and went down to 20, I think overnight or 25. So it's, um, yeah, I don't want to ever do that. Anybody that's ever had to lay off a lot of staff never wants to do it again. It's, uh, you know, it's not fun to be laid off, but it's uh, also not fun to lay people off. That's, um, that especially was, that when people are so dedicated time. and you know, the, I, I don't know what the, the, the work culture was for you, but from, you know, historical standpoint, it sounds like it, Sierra was a very close family. Yeah. It's just a lot yeah, of people respect was. each other, respected y'all's, you know, respect each other's time frames for projects. It was a good place to work at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People were, I think game development is fun, especially in those days. Today, you know, the games are big enough that you can work on a game and feel like you're just working on a tiny piece of it and not really able to influence the product. But in the early days, the teams are small enough that every member of the team was critical and can make a big difference in the product. So um, yeah, I would imagine that if you're working on a game with a thousand people, it's a different experience than working on a small team on a game. I, I worked so, at EA and it was, yeah. 
Oh, you work for the A. Yeah, uh, it was not fun. That's uh, yeah. No, thank you. That was, uh, that was horrible. Yeah, in those days, <laughs> everything was fun. And we were young. I mean, we were, um, yeah, what, 20s. And most of the team was, I mean, some of the team was even, you know, 18, 19. One guy work, I think, was like 17. And so it was kind of a party zone and fun. And, I mean, yeah, worked and partied and had fun together. So, but that was different. When the company grew, you know, things got a lot different. So, a little gotcha. more organized. And so Ponderosa Printing, was that the yeah. first office space that y'all rented uh, or leased to get your operations set up? How, how was it like, was it just you walk in and there's just computers and we're all just sitting around and we're making video games? <laughs> Is that uh -huh. how it was? Just a tiny yeah. little backside of a printer shop? Yeah, we, I mean, all of this happened so fast. I mean, we released the game in like May I quit my job almost immediately. I was working a, a regular gig as a, a programmer, plus moonlighting for people. I quit it, put the house for sale, and we moved almost immediately to Yosemite and um, changed the address on our packaging to be an address uh, in Course Code, California, which is up in the woods, and uh, still had our phone number on the back of the packages. and. Uh, it, I, yeah, we, we, I mean, success was so fast. I mean, we were flooded with phone calls 24 hours a day. Uh, Roberta and I were suddenly hiring local kids to come to our house to duplicate discs and to uh, put, you know, product in Ziploc bags. And uh, it probably wasn't two months when we rented an office at Ponderosa Printing. It was, it was really just an empty room upstairs in the back above the printing presses. And I think we probably outgrew that within a year, but I um, were probably even less than that. So it was, yeah, it was kind of a whirlwind. Nine, I guess it was 1980 that within one year we had gone from zero to a hundred people, something like that. It's incredible. That's some yeah. good growth. <laughs> some good growth. But we, I mean, we had you know hundred percent market share, oh, which yeah. was a good thing. So, oh, always. And I'm yeah. assuming from that from that uh, that growth, you were able to go by 48644 Victoria Lane over in Oakhurst. I'm thinking that's the address. Uh, yeah. I had to look it up on we, Google. Um, I saw it. You can still see it. There's a lot of trees if you go on Google Maps. The trees have yeah. kind of covered it up. A lot of us saw it in, I think it was Space Quest 2 or 3, where you turned poor Roger Wilco down for a janitorial job. That's, he just wanted to clean your bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah, the down. teams like to pick... Well, everybody likes Easter eggs and they used to throw in a lot. And my rule was that, I mean, I, it wasn't that I had an ego. I, they would put in uh, Easter eggs picking on each other or things that you know, customers couldn't relate to. At least oh, they'd pick, up on, they'd pick or, on other industries. They'd pick on other companies at the time. They'd pick on your competitors. Yeah, there's some there where they would put in and pick on. I, I just wanted to make sure whatever they put in there, if they snuck something in, with something the customers would care about, not just us. So, all right. By the way, that building's turned into a medical center. It's still standing. I don't know when the last still time we've gone down to to Oakhurst yeah, to check it out. Yeah, there was a second building in between that was huge. It was I don't know, it was twenty, thirty thousand square feet. That uh, was just a big um, tin can. I mean, it was put up quickly, and I believe it's still there and is a distribution center. So we went from Ponderosa Printing to probably that big building. And then over to the other building that was built for us that is now the medical center. So, or maybe it was the other way around. I don't, I don't remember. It's I, been a long yeah. time. It's been a long time, 40 years, something like that. All right. So yeah. next we're going to cover just some, some brief franchises. Uh, we'll start off with King's Quest. Was that the biggest moneymaker for Sierra? Yes. Well... Yeah, I mean, literally, probably the biggest money in Maker would have been Half-Life or Phantasmagoria, but those came much later. I, but King's Quest was the game that uh, put us back in business after the big collapse, and uh, was always kind of our biggest hit. It, um, yeah, I, we would release, um, and, and King's Quest was meant to be kind of where we would showcase new technology. In those days, computers were moving so fast that um, it, literally there would be a computer that had no sound, and then a computer would come along with sound, then somebody would come along with a graphics card, then somebody would come along with a better mouse, and 
you know, whatever it was, you had to show off the technology. And um, we used King's Quest to kind of experiment with new UIs, new technology. Um, yeah, in fact, it was King's Quest, first time we did kind of an animated uh, character in an adventure game. And uh, did the two and a half D, I guess we were the first ones to do that. And um, yeah, so people looked for a King's Quest game. It was kind of nice because you could plan on, I mean, the market was smaller then, but you could always count on at least 100 or 200,000 copies going out the door on day one. Mark Crow, Scott Murphy, they come to you with an idea. It's silly, it's outer space, and they want to make it happen. What, what was the process of making a game like Space Quest, some off the wall idea? Like, yeah. we like it, we want to do it, can we do it? Yeah, they were lobbying me to do Space Quest, and they had the vision for the game, and um, I wasn't getting it, for lack of a better word. Um, and I said, fine, use your own time, mock something up, and I'll see what I think. And they did that. Um, Mark is an amazing artist, and Scott has a real uh, bizarre sense of humor. And they uh, worked together, and they uh, put a few rooms together, and it just blew me away. I loved it immediately and uh, started the project going and uh, and it was one of our biggest hits they've great uh, even now um they're doing a space venture game which has been in development for over a decade and um i got briefly involved in it and even did some um well some uh, adapting on it to move it to a different version of unity and um that's a pretty cool product it's really fun um uh, uh, buggy as heck with a small team it's tough to get all the bugs out of an adventure game because people play them every different way but hopefully they'll get that game on the market someday because it really is a good game i'm and glad that you it, said that too uh, i'm glad that you said the play a different way because that's what made quest for glory one so interesting yeah you can yeah, play they, it however you wanted to play it yeah it it I, I, yeah, they, they came to me once again with the idea for doing something completely different. And uh, that's what I like more than anything is uh, something I haven't seen before. And, um, and it's tough to do that today because there's so many people building games that finding a niche where somebody hasn't done it 50 times is tough. But um, yeah, in those days, uh, you know, there was nothing like that. And, uh, and it used our technology, which I liked. You know, because, um, you know, by, uh, there was no game engines. Today, you can use Unreal or um, Unity, and you can be effectively working on your game and not bog down in trying to build an engine. And uh, But in those days, uh, part of Sierra's success was that we had an underlying engine that allowed us to uh, focus on building games, not on things like hardware compatibility. So, yeah. And, and yeah, and, and Quest for Glory used that and steered it a new direction. So they did a good job. And they're still out there building games, Glory and Glory. You are standing at the end of a road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. A small stream flows out the building and down a gully. These are the first words you would have seen in the late 1970s if you booted up William Crowther's Adventure a game that for many would open the floodgates for a new genre of gaming, the adventure game. Now, almost 50 years later, Cygnus Entertainment, led by Ken and Roberta Williams, have brought that same energy to a new generation of gamers with their 2023 release of Colossal Cave, a top-to-bottom, one-to-one reimagining of this time-cherished game. It's out on various platforms, and I'll go ahead and link it in the description down below. I strongly encourage you to check it out. It's the perfect tribute to the great-grandfather of the genre. That being said, this is part one of two, so don't forget to check out the second half. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify her out.